Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brendan Holland, and I'm the Chief of the Industry Analysis Division at the Media Bureau here at the FCC. While we perhaps would have preferred to be welcoming everyone to our new space at the FCC's headquarters here in Washington, hosting the webinar today online will hopefully make it a little easier for folks far and wide to join us today to hear about the 2021 Broadcast Station Ownership Report filing window, which just opened on October 1st. Presenting today will be my colleagues Jake Ream and Bill Durdetch from the, uh, from the Industry Analysis Division of the Media Bureau. Now, hopefully the ownership report is already familiar to most of you, and there really isn't anything particularly new or challenging to highlight this year. So Jake and Bill will be walking through the basic steps for filing, as well as discuss some tips and ways to avoid common filing errors when submitting the reports. And they will also point you to some additional FCC resources if you need further information along the way. Throughout the presentation, folks can also send us questions by email at form323 at FCC.gov, and we'll display and repeat that address a few times during the presentation. After Bill and Jake's main presentation, we'll see if we can answer any questions that you all may have had along the way today. So without further delay, I'll turn things over to Bill. Bill? Thank you, Brendan. And uh, thank you for our, thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. Brendan, if we could go to slide two, thank you. So just looking at our agenda, as you know, uh, for several years now, promoting female and minority ownership has been an important goal of the commission. Like any other goal, you can't advance it if you do not have accurate data to inform your decisions. This is why the biennial ownership report window and the form 323 and 323E are so important. Hopefully this program achieves two things. First, it raises awareness. It reminds every broadcaster that this is something that needs to be completed. And second, we want to educate you on the process. Now, if you are an experienced filer, nothing, nothing, none of this will be earth shattering and you should be in good shape. The system has not changed since the last filing window. However, we just wanna share the basics about the window and also point to the common mistakes made by filers that delay the timely delivery of the finished report. In years past, commission staff has spent a lot of time working with filers who either missed the deadline or made errors that took considerable time to fix. We want to avoid that as much as possible. We're here to answer your questions. If you have any during the session, please email us at form323 at fcc.gov with info session in the subject line. We hope to answer all questions today, but if not, we will get to you shortly afterward. We also encourage you to email us at a later, later date at the same address if you have any other questions. Go to the next slide. So as promised, here are some of the basics. As you know, the filing window is two months long. It, it opened on October 1st and will close on December 1st. By that date, all reports must be filed. Reports must be filed by licensees of full power television, class A television, low power television, AM radio, and FM radio stations. Further, Entities and individuals that hold an attributable interest in those stations must also file a report. These are known as parent reports. Form 323 and 323E are available on the Commission's licensing and management system known as LMS, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. If you're a commercial station, you will use Form 323. Non-commercial stations will use Form 323E. A filing fee applies to certain report filers. Specifically, an $85 fee applies to AM and FM radio stations, as well as full power TV stations. However, Class A and LP TV stations do not have a filing fee and neither do non-commercial stations. Further, filers of parent reports do not have to pay a fee. It's important to note that all information must be current as of October 1st, 2021. That means that anything that has happened since Friday or will happen in the near future is not material to the report. The biennial report should be a snapshot of what station ownership looked like on October 1st of this year. As I mentioned before, all biennial ownership reports must be submitted electronically via LMS. In order to log in and begin your report, you will need an FCC registration number known as an FRN. If you do not already have an FRN, you can obtain one from the commission registration system known as CORS. For most of you, however, however, you already have an FRN, so this should not be an issue. 
Again, biennial ownership reports are important because they inform the commission as to who owns and controls stations, as well as tells us the diversity and multiplicity of owners. Specific information is required, and you should look at the instructions and refer to them when completing the reports. The ownership reports require two main sets of data. First, the reports must list all stations and licenses that the ownership report applies to. Second, each report must provide important information about the entity or individual filing the report. Go to the next slide, please. See, here's an example of one of the, the first uh, set of data that I was mentioning. If you look here, here is a parent report that lists two licensees uh, that is under their control. And if you see, they list the, for the licensee, they have Station Venture Operations LP. They list the FRN, and they also cover the facility ID, call sign, city, state, and service. Uh, and that is done there for both licensees that they have a, an attributable interest in. So not, not again, none of this is kind of earth shattering. It's basically any information that would be used to identify the station. Now in the next slide, we will cover in, in section two, if you see the filer will have to provide uh, information about the about themselves uh, here, excuse me, in, no, in section two, uh, under ownership interest, the filer will, will have to provide information on the individual or entity filing the report. Now, in LMS, uh, as the screen says, the first entry for this question prefills automatically with information already responded and just restates information for the respondent. Thereafter, the filer must provide a separate entity, uh, entry for each additional entity or individual with an attributable interest in the respondent. In section two, the filer will have to provide their FRN, their name, address, listing type, positional interest, as well as the voting equity and total asset percentage. The filer will also be asked whether they have any attributable interest in any stations that do not appear on the report. Now, it's important to note that if a report is being filed on behalf of an individual rather than an entity, you will have to provide additional information about the individual. This includes providing information about their citizenship, their gender, their ethnicity, their race, and their race. It's also important to note that reports for attributable entities also require an indication as to whether the party is a tribal nation or an entity or a tribal nation or entity. And as Jake will soon explain in greater detail, you will also need to answer if any interest is jointly held. So that covers the basics for the most part. If you have done this before, you should be good. Again, this isn't earth shattering, but I will now hand it over to Jake Ream, who will give you an overview of the common mistakes made by filers so we can try our best to avoid them. Thank you, Bill. I'm Jake Ream. I'm the assistant chief here in the industry analysis division of the Media Bureau. And I do want to just go over some filing tips and avoiding errors. Before I get into the um, to the details here, there are two guiding principles involved. One is that we would like to reduce the amount of effort required for stations to com complete and submit their filings. And the second goal is to make sure the data the commissions get, the data that the commission gets, which is made available to the public as well, is accurate and complete. Related to both of these goals, if we find errors in filings that impact our, our data, we will require fixes to the forms via amendments. Uh, these corrective amendments are not ideal for the commission because we need to do a large amount of back and forth with filers to make our data complete and accurate. Uh, more importantly, from your perspective, perhaps, amendments are not ideal for you, uh, for filers, because they entail extra work and sometimes uh, after a significant amount of time. Uh, so basically, all these tips are meant to uh, to reduce the effort and make our data more complete. And these goals end up really going hand in hand. OK, next slide. Um, this is one that people are probably mostly aware of, but just a reminder, in old versions of Form 323 and 323E, a, a parent report could only specify one subsidiary licensee, uh, and that 
and that meant that if a parent entity had seven subsidiary licensees, for example, it had to file seven, se several, seven separate ownership reports, and they would differ only with respect to the licensee and stations listed. Uh, and you could see that if you had a very complicated ownership structure, the, num the amount of extra and, and largely duplicative reports required might explode uh, fairly quickly. Uh, since these reports got into LMS, uh, it, is it is possible for a parent entity to specify uh, multiple licensee subsidiaries, which greatly reduces um, the number of um, reports required. Uh, and I see most people are making use of that, but every once in a while I do see somebody who is not aware that they can specify multiple licensee subs. Um, and so it is important to, to remember that and save some work. Um, how does this work? I don't want to get into the uh, LMS weeds too much in this info session because that's not really the point here, but it's useful with this slide to do that. The way it works is when you add a subsidiary licensee, you enter its FRN, and then uh, the system will populate a list of stations, um, and it will, uh, and sorry, it'll pop populate the licensee's name, and it will populate a list of stations that you can choose from. LMS populates that list based on past associations in LMS and I guess previously in CDBS between uh, the licensees FRN and, the, and those stations. And that means that the list that populates for you to choose from is very much over-inclusive. It includes, very likely includes many more stations than you want to include. So you'll put the licensees FRN, you'll get the list of stations, and then you'll select for, for inclusion a subset of the stations that, that LMS makes available to you. It's really important to not just blindly select all the stations and move on. It's very important to think about what stations on the list are licensed to you as a 10-1 and include only those stations. So, so that's one caveat is when you're adding all these licensees and their stations, really pay attention to uh, the list and select only the stations you want. Okay, next uh, next slide. Um, a lot of these kind of overlap a bit, but um, you know, for the last slide we were talking about what can happen when uh, the station list becomes inaccurate just because um, the filer is not necessarily paying close attention and is just sort of blindly including stations on the form. Another uh, thing that can happen is station lists can be incorrect because um, the filer is not being mindful of the October 1st as of date of the report. How does this happen? Here are some examples. Sometimes a state a filer will list stations that the filer owned before, but sold before the as of date. So maybe this, this station was last listed on the old ownership report, but doesn't belong on the current one because it's been sold. Um, some filers will list stations that they did not yet own on the as of date, October 1st, because they are part of some sort of pending transaction. So maybe they have an assignment application on file to acquire those stations. And maybe that, that assignment application will even be granted and consummated before the window closes. Nonetheless, the ownership report should only include what you owned as of October 1st. Um, some stations fail, do the, do the opposite of this, I guess. They fail to list stations that they owned on the as of date, but subsequently sold. So for example, if, if uh, an assignment of a station to, a, to, a, to another licensee occurred on October 3rd, um, that means that that station should not be included on your ownership report. Even if you end up filing your biennial report sometime in November, the as of date is still October 1st. Uh, you know, and then I will harp on this, when station lists are inaccurate, the ownership information for the stations does not process correctly, um, and we will require a corrective amendment. And I, I will just say here, we definitely recognize that this is a little bit counterintuitive. I know for most things that you file with the commission, you're filing it on a certain date, and you're thinking, I should make this accurate as of right now. Um, and so we recognize that this is counterintuitive, but we do ask you to, to keep in mind the October 1st date. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a, a different kind of uh, station list problem. Uh, for uh, multiple, own for uh, for ownership structures with multiple levels, there's going to be licensee report and, and multiple parent reports. 
And for the state for the information for a station to process properly, that station must be listed on all of the ownership reports that apply to it. So it must that station must be on the licensee report and must be on each of the parent reports, or else the ownership information doesn't doesn't track through. So that means you need to make sure, as we talked about, we need to make sure that the licensee report includes all the stations licensed as of 10-1. And when you're filing the parent reports listing multiple licensees and stations at a time, you need to make sure the licensee and stations list match all the way up. And again, if, if, if there's a mismatch in this regard, the filings are incomplete and we're going to have to uh, have you amend it to fix it. Okay. Um, this is the big one, consistent FRN usage. So each individual or entity that files a, a, a form 323 or 323E or that is listed on a form 323 or 323E, for example, in the ownership interest section or in the licensee and station section, all those individuals and entities must provide an FRN. As Bill noted earlier, you get, you get your FRN via course through a process that is largely familiar to you, I'm sure. Um, the FRN's job is to uniquely identify individual entities. And when parties do not use FRNs consistently, submitted ownership data cannot be searched, cross-referenced, or processed reliably. Accordingly, it is crucial that FRN usage be consistent throughout the ownership filings. What does that mean? Next slide. Um, so again, it just means that 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 it needs to be consistent within the various parts of the form on which FR, FRNs appear. Where do FRNs appear? The first place they appear is at the very beginning of the report, where you're, ident where you're identifying the respondent. You'll see that you have the respondent's FRN and name appear there. FRNs also appear in the licensee and stations portion of the report. We talked about that earlier. This is where you're listing all the licensees to which report applies and you identify them by FRN and name and then underneath there's a, a list of stations. Uh, next slide. And also it appear FRNs appear in the ownership interest portion of the form where filers list the parties with attributable interest in the respondent. And this is a little small to see, but but this is like a sample uh, ownership interest record for an entity. And the first thing you see is the FRN for the entity and then its name and individual records, uh, sorry, records for individuals look the same way. They all have an FRN. Next slide. The consistency we're looking for is as follows. Once an FRN is reported for a party on Form 323 or Form 323E, that same FRN must be used for the party on all ownership filings. Now, ideally, each person or entity only has one has one and only one FRN, but we recognize that in some cases, a person or entity has multiple FRNs. Uh, and this is the problem and the situation we're trying to solve. In such a situation, it is important that, that the individual or entity select one FRN and they use it consistently on all their ownership reports. Um, some examples. If you use an FRN to identify a licensee, for example, on a licensee report, you must use that same FRN to identify that licensee on all of the parents' reports. Um, sometimes, uh, another example, in the ownership interest section, sometimes a party, a person or entity appears on multiple reports. For example, an entity may be a parent to multiple subsidiaries in your ownership chain, or an individual might have a triple interest in multiple entities in your ownership change. You must use the same FRN to report that, refer to that party, individual or entity, on each report on which the party appears. Uh, and this is a, a big issue we see. When you list an attributable entity uh, in the ownership interest section of a report, so for example, if a licensee has a parent entity, and you list that parent entity on the licensee's report in the ownership interest section, you will provide an FRN for that entity. Later on, you're going to have to file a parent report for that parent entity. You must use the same FRN to refer to the respondent on that parent report that you use to refer to the entity in the, in the licensee report. 
if those if those FRNs do not match up, uh, the ownership information will not process properly, uh, and the ownership information is incomplete. If we see these kinds of mass mismatches, we will um, require amendments to fix them. Um, and getting it right the first time is a lot easier than filing amendments because it could be lots of amendments to fix these things. Um, couple notes. Um, this FRN consistency does not just apply to reports filed by one station. If an individual or entity appears on reports for multiple stations, all of these stations must coordinate with each other to can ensure consistent FRN usage across reports. This also does not just apply within a specific filing window. Once a party uses an FRN on Form 323 or 323E, that party must use uh, the sa that same FRN uh, in future filing windows as well. So the bottom line is it is imperative that you really double check the FRNs used throughout the reports to ensure that FRN usage is consistent, that each reported listed entity uses one and only FRN, one and, one and only one FRN. Uh, and you good to avoid that uh, because you will avoid the need to file corrective amendments. Next slide. Uh, this doesn't apply to a whole lot of people, but it's worth going over. Um, identify jointly held voting interests properly. Um, as we've discussed earlier, one of the things that you uh, you specify in the ownership interest section for each reported party is what their voting interest is, is in the respondent. And that's a percentage. And then there's a question that asks if that voting interest is jointly held. Uh, this is explained, what this means is explained in the instructions and it's worth reading it in detail. It's meant to capture a situation in which two or more parties hold the interest uh, together as joint tenants as opposed to um, separately. So for example, if two parties hold 100% of the voting interest in an entity together as joint tenants rather than 50 of them, uh, each of them holding 50% of the, of the interest separately. And um, in such a way that the parties can um, exercise that voting interest individually. What do I mean by this? We see this a lot in, uh, I see this a lot in radio, uh, where a station or group of stations might be, um, a licensee might be owned uh, by two people often who are related to each other. They're often husband and wife or brother and sister or parent and child. And they own that interest 100% as joint tenants. So the, the husband owns 100% of the voting interest and the wife owns 100% of the voting interest and either one of them can exercise that voting interest on their own. This also comes up, uh, I see this in a, often in, in private equity funds where sort of at the top of them, 100% uh, of the voting interest is held in such a way that there are several people hold the 100% interest in each one of them could exercise that 100% voting interest on their own. So this jointly held voting interest is a very particular way of, hold, of holding, holding a voting interest. And it's important to answer yes to the jointly held question only if the interest in question really is jointly held. Otherwise, answer no. And there's again, there's a difference between a husband and wife, for example, owning a radio station such that the husband holds 50% of the voting interest and the wife holds 50% of the voting interest versus both of them holding 100% of the voting interest together. And that's what we're trying to capture here. Next slide. Um, there is copy and pre-fill functionality in LMS uh, that allows you to create reports based on previous reports or other reports and pre-filled data. Uh, and this allows you to save time and reduce work and help avoid errors. So it is important to use these, these, these functionalities to save yourself time and effort. Lots of filers have to submit multiple reports. They have long station lists, multiple attributable interest holders, and they're extensive documents. And entering all of this information from scratch for each report that you have to submit could take a lot of time 
uh, and, and effort and, and injuring uh, the information. Also, that's just a lot more keystrokes and keystrokes lead to data entry errors. Um, so, but but if you have a lot of parent reports to file, for example, that are similar in a lot of ways and only need a few changes to make them different, uh, you can copy and pre-fill information and save time. Uh, similarly, you can um, you can copy and pre-fill information from a previous biennial report into the new one and only change what you need to change instead of typing everything uh, anew. So uh, definitely use the copy and pre-fill functionality in LMS to create the new filings based on existing filings to save yourself um, time and effort and to reduce errors. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned before, I don't want to turn this webinar into an, uh, an LMS in the weeds session. Uh, there, are, there are basically three ways to use the copy pre-fill functionality in LMS. Um, they are discussed in much more detail in our facts, which we'll provide a, li a link to at the end of the presentation. Uh, and, and to tell you the truth, they're, they're all pretty self-explanatory. Um, but the, the first one here allows you to um, create a, a new filing based on an ownership report that's already been submitted. So this would be what you'd use, for example, if you were trying to make your 2021 filing based on your 2019 filing, you start a new biennial form in LMS, and then there's an option that says, do you want to pre-fill from previous filing? And you and you uh, you put the file number in the box and you hit the button and then the, the data from the 2019 filing populates in and you can change it as needed. Um, another way is you can log into LMS using the same FRN that was used to make the previous filing. Then you can find the, you go to the reports tab, and you can click uh, the file number of the form you wish to copy or pre-fill from, um, and you can select copy to biennial. That's another way you can accomplish the same thing. Uh, options one and two are, are ways that you can um, copy and pre-fill from a report that's already being submitted. Option three allows you to do this with a, a report that hasn't been submitted yet. Uh, that may be just sitting in sitting in your account ready to be submitted and what you can do there is you go to the saved application tab find the application and click the copy button uh, again these are pretty self-explanatory they're discussed in much more detail in um in our facts uh but that's basically how they work next slide um this all comes with a caveat right uh, the caveat is this, with this ease of copying and pre-filling information also comes the ease of being sloppy and making mistakes. Again, it's important that the information is accurate. A lot of the errors that I discuss above, like inconsistent FRN usage, station list problems, they can occur when filers copy and pre-fill from previous filings, but then do not take the next step of verifying that what they're copying and pre-filling is consistent that remains correct, et cetera, et cetera. So once you've created the new filing by copying and pre-filling, please verify that everything is still accurate. And if it's not accurate and the FRNs are not what they should be, go ahead and make those changes before submitting. Um, otherwise, we're gonna require uh, you to make a corrective amendment. And you know, uh, I wanna stress that, that um, copying and pre-filling bad information is, is a great way to have to file a lot of amendments. So if you get the amendments, if you get the information right, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time. Next slide. Oh, I guess that's it. We're ready for the, for the Q&A. Yes, we, thank you for everyone for sending your questions. Uh, again, if you have any questions on this, we have, uh, please send it to the form 323 at fcc.gov mailbox uh, with info session in the, uh, in the subject line. We've had a few questions come in, so please keep them coming. Um, one of the first ones we got, I would just take care of a few of these. Uh, it said that, asked that in previous years, the window had been extended beyond December 1st. Uh, do you expect that to, do you expect us to do, or excuse me, do you expect to do that again this time? Uh, so by rule, the window runs from October 1st to December 1st. Uh, currently, we do not have plans to extend the 2021 window, but should that change, uh, we would issue a public notice in advance. Another question came in that uh, when preparing my report, 
Uh, I noticed some issues with my ownership reports from last time. Can I fix those? Uh, as Jake said, I mean, being able to copy and to pre-fill the reports is a huge benefit in LMS uh, that should save a lot of time. But uh, you're, you, in that instance, you would not be able to that once a biennial window opens, uh, it is no longer possible to submit new reports for previous windows or to amend reports filed in previous windows. Uh, another came question came uh, another question that came across uh, relates to uh, CDBS. Uh, as you know, the the commission transitioned away from CDBS to LMS uh, a few years ago. Uh, the question was, can you copy info from an old ownership report that was filed in CDBS? Uh, unfortunately, you cannot. Uh, you can only copy report from reports that were prepared and filed in LMS. Um, another question that came across was, do TV translators, FM translators, and FM boosters have to file an ownership report? Um, no, they do not. I, I, we do see how they are under the, in, in LMS, uh, you have the opportunity to, to include them in a report, uh, but they do not need to be included. So. That being said, I have, there was another question that just came in, which was, can we include them? And the answer to that is yes. You don't do any harm by including them. Um, you just don't have to. If you list them, um, they will not be feed. Uh, there will no be no feed uh, uh, attached to them. So, and I and I know there are some people who like to include all of their um, authorizations on their biennial ownership reports because then the biennial ownership report can serve as sort of a reference for what did I have on October 1st, regardless of whether it had to file or not. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just a different approach. Um, but you do not uh, but you do not have to list them, but you can. And Jake, again, the, the key there is they, those those uh, facilities, boosters and translators do not incur a, a filing fee. Correct. So it automatically pulls in. Uh, but but I would say that you should um, uh, just pay attention to them. Uh, and if you are going to include them, make sure they're accurate as well. Uh, just to, to, you know, to take a look at them, because um, it, it could get lost in the noise if you're automatically importing, um, you know, a whole list of facilities, full power, low power, translators, boosters and so forth. It is worth going through to make sure that it is completely accurate. I've got a couple more um, questions that have come in. Uh, we're probably not going to be able to get to all of them here, but we're trying to get to the ones that we're seeing a lot. One question I'm getting is, will there be an option to to uh, certify to validate and resubmit a previous biennial certifying no changes uh, from the previous biennial report? Uh, yes, there will be that option. Um, uh, I just one thing I will say is that um, that option really doesn't differ very much from copying and pre-filling from, from a previous report, except in one respect. When you hit, when you say button, when you hit the button that says, I want to validate and, and resubmit certifying no changes, our system will forbid you from making any changes to the report, right? Because what you're telling us when you select that option is that my, my new biennial looks exactly like my old biennial. So it wouldn't make any sense for us to allow you to select that option and then make changes uh, to what the old report said on the new report. So if you have changes um, to make, then I, I would suggest you not use the validate and resubmit option, and that you should uh, instead just copy. My own personal view on this, which you can take or leave, is that I'm not sure there's really any upside to, to selecting validate and resubmit. I would just copy and prefill uh, if I was doing ownership reports. Which is basically just as easy, right, Jake? I mean, you're, yeah, you're, it's, you're it's the same right, thing, copying the whole thing, but it leaves you the option to to make any tweaks if you realize your address is wrong or you misspelled someone's name or something like that. But it, but but copying uh, uh, copying over from an existing filing just puts the whole thing in there in in a in a, um, a form that you can review it, make any tweaks, and then press the button to submit. So that's almost just as easy. And also, I mean, I I, I remember getting questions in the last window from people who said, you know, I chose validate and submit, but one of my officers is not the same as last time. How do I make that change? And the answer is you can't, you have to back out and do a copy. So I, I, I would just use the copy pre-fill functionality and, and not bother with validate and resubmit, but that's just uh, my two cents on that. 
I got a question. Can you copy or pre-fill from a post-consummation report? Yes, you can. But bear in mind that the uh, information required on a post-consummation report is less than the information that is required on a biennial report. For example, uh, is, as we mentioned earlier, for individuals, there is race, gender, and ethnicity information that is required uh, for individuals on the biennial report. That is not required on a um, non-biennial report. Uh, I saw that's not, that's, yeah, it's not required on a non-binary report. So if you copy a non-binary report to make a binary report, you're going to have to go back in and put in the race, gender, and, and ethnicity information. So it saves you some time, but but it won't save you all, all the rekeying, or it won't save you from having to key in some data just because, the, because there's less information on the report that you're copying. But Jake, if the if the uh, if, since your last biennial, if you filed, for example, a post consummation ownership report that is more current and is an easier starting point for you, you can cross reference that file number, pull in that as the starting point. But knowing that you're going to have to go into each of your individuals, perhaps, and answer for their race, ethnicity, and gender, and make sure that it's otherwise complete. Right. That is correct. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm a little distracted. I'm monitoring the questions as they come in <laughs> a little bit here. Uh, I've been asked, please remind everybody that low power FM stations are not required to submit ownership reports. Done. Everybody, low power FM stations are not required to submit ownership reports. Only uh, full power AM and FM stations, full power television stations, class A television stations, low power television stations. Um, I'm looking here. People have asked me who are the attributable interest holders in um, in uh, non-commercial stations. Uh, typically, those are your officers and your directors. So it's the members of your of your governing board, uh, and and sometimes like SE licensees independently have officers as well. That is what's most typical. Um. I have got a question here that asks me, will special use FRNs continue to be available? Um, when we were talking uh, about FRNs in this presentation, we focused on CORE's FRNs. That is what the lion's share of, of, of filers will be using to identify uh, well, they would be using any entity is referred to with a with a course FRN, and most individuals are. But I guess it's it's worth uh, going through how cores FRNs, restricted use FRNs, and special use FRNs work. And Jake, um, just before you do that, if I could interrupt, sure. just to say, I, nothing has changed this time with regard to Correct. the usage of those things. So what Jake is going to talk about here is consistent with the last couple of windows that we've had. Um, and there are different types of FRNs, and J Jake will explain, you know, when and it's appropriate to use those, or who may more frequently use those. Um, but the the I'd say the the preliminary point I would want to make is that nothing has changed with respect to the use of FRNs from years past. And I think our consistent message, as as uh, Jake had in his presentation, would be to use them consistently, uh, focus on one and only one across all of your forms. Um, but that that nothing nothing in regard to the use of FRNs really should have changed this time. So with that, I, I, I'll, Jake, I'll let you get to the weeds. Yeah. Um, so every entity, so you're going to be reporting individuals and entities. Uh, every entity must use a course FRN. Every licensee, including licensees that are individuals, must use a course FRN. And any party that has a course FRN must use that course FRN. That being said, what is a restricted use FRN? Restricted use FRNs are available to individuals, but not entities that are reported on Form 323 and 323E that do not already have a course FRN and are not themselves licensees. These these restricted use FRNs can only be used on forms 323 and 323E. They don't have any other use within the commission. 
uh, instead of providing a social security number to get a restricted use FRN, that's what you do to get a CORS FRN. Uh, restricted use FRNs, applicants provide their full name, their residential address, their date of birth, and the last four digits of their social security number. Uh, you you still do get a restricted use FRN via the via cores, but it's just a different kind of FRN. The next kind of FRN that exists is called a special use FRN. Again, these only apply to individuals. Uh, they don't apply to individuals who are licensees, and they are not available to people who already have a cores FRN or a restricted use FRN. Uh, how do you get a special use FRN? You can generate a special use FRN to refer to an individual just by hitting a button on the form that says generate special use FRN. And then the system will generate a special use FRN and you can use it. Who gets to do this? Special use FRNs are pretty freely available to individuals who reported on Form 323E, that is on non-commercial filings. The requirements for special use FRNs on commercial for commercial filers are much more stringent, and, and in general, you don't see special use FRNs on commercial filings. Before reporting a special use FRN on a commercial filing, the filer has to make reasonable and good faith efforts to obtain uh, a standard course FRN or restricted use FRN uh, from or on behalf of an individual. You have to instruct the individual of their obligation to obtain a course FRN or a restricted use FRN and the risk of enforcement action for failing to provide the information needed to enable the filer to report a course FRN or restricted use FRN. Uh, special, special use FRN may report it for the individual only if despite these good faith efforts, the individual still refuses, refuses to provide a means of reporting a valid course FRN or restricted use FRN. Um, licensee, uh if LIC has to do that, they would they should um document their good faith efforts uh, uh to avoid um uh enforcement concerns based on that. Um and and just to reiterate what uh Brendan just said, like course FRNs, both restricted use FRNs and special use FRNs have to be used consistently. Once you use it for an individual, you got to use it on all their filings. Uh, and uh, the only quote unquote exceptions to this are, are sort of what I already say. If an uh, I've already said, if an individual that used a special use FRN later obtains a CORS FRN or a restricted use FRN, you have to use that CORS FRN or restricted use FRN going forward. And if an individual that had a restricted use FRN later gets a CORS FRN, that CORS FRN must be used going forward. That's kind of complicated, uh, but I, I hope that was um, clear enough. And it is also, Jake, I think that, that we've referred to our FAQs. Um, that is something that, again, hasn't changed this year and is pretty well covered in our frequently asked questions uh, on, the, on the website that we'll point you to here at the, uh, at the end of the, the discussion here. Jake, we just had a, a question come across on on that note, are you able to um, to remain consistent over filings? Can you convert a special use FRN to a CORS FRN for someone that is now reporting more regularly and willing to obtain a CORS FRN? Yeah, I just saw that come through. Um, I, I think the question is, is you can't convert, you can't directly convert a special use FRN to a CORS FRN. You can't, that it will be a new number if you're asking, can somebody who got a special use FRN later get a CORS FRN and start using that going forward? Yes, that that can happen, and 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 we would love for that to happen. We 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 prefer CORS FRNs to special use FRNs. Uh, there's no way to directly convert one FRN to another, but somebody who had a special use FRN can get a CORS FRN later and begin using it. And then make sure not to confuse the two, right? Once you go to a full CORS FRN, and as the the questioner uh, proposes. You happen to be doing more business at the FCC. Use that full cores FRN religiously, and uh, and and drop using the special special use that you had used in the past. Correct. Correct. Uh, another question that came in, and in the past we have filed a separate report for parent entities and individuals for each station under common ownership. Based on the webinar, can we now file a single report for a parent report 
that simply lists all the various stations in which that parent has an ownership interest? Uh, yes. Yes, and I would very much encourage you to do to do so. That was my, I believe that was the first point under the filing tips and avoiding errors. Def, definitely, if a parent has multiple licensee subs, um, you can list uh, and should list all the licensee subs and all of their stations on, on a single report. Um, that saves a lot of time. That reduces a lot of effort and errors. And Jake, just to reiterate, when you do that, you'll cross-reference the FRN for the subsidiary license companies. And by doing that, that FRN will then list all of the stations linked with that particular company, that subsidiary. Yeah. And so that should be a really easy way. If you've got a parent company that holds an interest in a couple of different subs, you put in the FRNs for the subs and it will populate with all the stations held by those subsidiaries. They'll just double check it, and uh, and hopefully that means you filing one parent level report for all those commonly held subsidiaries. In fact, what it's going to populate with is a very over inclusive list of stations that have ever been associated with that FRN, just because that's the way the system has to work. But you'll be able to check off the ones that that apply, the stations that still apply that apply to the to the particular report, uh, and it's quite easy to do that. Another question that came across. As it relates to Form 323, 323E, what constitutes an attributable interest for an individual in a nonprofit college which does not have individual shareholders? Right, and uh, th that one I um, I uh, got to, I think I just answered that question maybe 10 minutes ago, but it's typically um, your, um, it's typically your board members and any officers or directors that you have. Uh, and and 323, um, 323 E attribution questions can get complicated uh, for some people to think through. So um, we can answer other 323 E uh, questions uh, more directly probably mm -hmm. than, than here. Uh, do you see any other? I see there was one came across early on. Um, we had one asked a question about they they were the winning bidder of a auction 109 permit. Oh yeah, I saw that one. That's a very specific question, but it, but um, construction permits uh, that are not yet licensed facilities uh, do not file by any ownership reports. Yeah. So the question, operative question, is whether you're licensed as of uh, October one. So if you're just an initial permit, then no. I got, um, let me see if, I'm sorry, I'm reading, reading questions we got here. Uh, this is a question that, that uh, this, this is a, a good question. Um, if you look at um, a licensee report, both 323 and 323E, uh, one of the things this, that asks you to do is, is, is upload a PDF of your ownership structure or, or provide a description of it. And I think this is uh, clarified in, in the form itself, but let me make it clear. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a licensee that has no parent entities. And in fact, that's very common in the NCE world, uh, but it's also common uh, in radio uh, and, and, and some TV services as well. If you don't have a parent entity, uh, then, you, then there's a textual exhibit there that you could just type in licensee has no parent entities, and then you're done. So if you have no parent entity, you do not have to upload uh, a big PDF uh, because that PDF wouldn't really say anything. I think that's all we've got here. Uh, I just got another one that came in. Ah, this is a very good question. If if a licensee entity is also a parent entity to other to another licensee, do they have to file two ownership reports? This does not come up very often, uh, but it does come up sometimes. Um, sometimes there's a situation where there's an entity that's a licensee that also has one or more subsidiary licensees. And uh, the question is how many reports you have to file for that entity. In that, rare, in that rare circumstances, you have to file two reports. One is the licensee report that uh, lists the stations that are licensed to the licensee. 
And one is a parent report that will list all the stations that are licensed to the licensee subsidiaries. So yeah, in that weird situation, which is fairly rare, but 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 not not uh, but does happen. Yes, then you have to file two reports then. And Jake, that also kind of makes sense because when the licensee is filing a licensee level report, that is where the fees attach. So if that entity holds one license, it'll file a licensee level report. It will pay for that one license. And then it will file a respondent level report, a parent level report, where it says, I'm also in the ownership chain of all these other 25 stations. And that level as a parent does not uh, it, it, uh, incur any uh, filing fees. So it, so it seems duplicative, but it's logical in the sense of, uh, of, of the progression of your reporting on your own behalf as a licensee, and then in the ownership structure for these other companies that you may own. So uh, and and we, uh, like uh, Bill said at the at the top of the presentation, the this uh, email box is open all time uh, all the time, and so if folks have additional questions as they're preparing their forms or going through the window, please feel free to uh, to reach out to us there. We will try and respond as quickly as we can, and certainly if you have a more um, specific uh, fact pattern or issue that you're dealing with or um, filing problems with LMS or things of that nature, use that uh, use that uh, email address to contact us and it will be open throughout the window. Um, and if we don't have any more immediate questions, I'll flip back to the to the uh, to the other slide, Jake, where we can tell people uh, some additional resources that we have on the web. Um, okay. If that works. And the only other thing I would say is that uh, D D Bill also noted that uh, both that we got a question on it and in the in the beginning of the presentation, that per the FCC's rules, the filing window is open from October 1st to December 1st. Um, in previous windows, there have been a variety of reasons as to why that has either been extended or even delayed where the window wasn't open in time. Um, and that involved issues related to um, the implementation of forms, uh, filing systems, capability as at the, here at the FCC, as well as rulemakings that may have been affecting the uh, the rollout of those things. This year, we don't have any any such kind of uh, uh, guiding or, or unique uh, issues to deal with. So for now, uh, we are following the the time frame set in the in the rules, and the goal is to get everything in and filed by December first. But certainly, if there is a a, a reason for an extension. Um, or if we get a, a call for an extension, we will make sure that we are messaging with folks and you will see any kind of communications from us. But uh, the, the takeaway message today should be that De December 1st is our target for filing all of these. So Jake, let me go back and, uh, and we'll just, put up a slide. Yep. I just wanna say here that if we haven't gotten to one of your questions, um, it may be because we're managing a lot of the email here and we've missed it. It may be because it's a very specific question uh, that we want to think about, or that, or that is is not really the best for this this uh, this webinar session. But we will get back to you. Uh, we're going to go through all the emails that we've gotten during the uh, during the webinar, and and um, we'll see if we've answered those questions. And if we have it, we'll get back to you. So you will hear from us. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess I guess that this is the end. Uh, uh, just reminders that, that the deadline is December 1st, as he said. We're accurate as, Octo as of October 1st. Um, give you a, I've given you a link there. It's on our in the Media Bureau website. There are, there are links to um, forms and instructions, facts about the forms. We did a 2017 information session about, about ownership filings, and uh, Probably very soon we will post a link to today's information session there. So there's a lot of uh, uh, useful information there. There's also Form 323 and 323E public notices on the Media Bureau website, and I gave you the link. And I want to reiterate once again, the Form 323 at FCC.gov uh, email box. And I guess one last thing I would like to say is that there's a lot of people out there that know me, or no Bill, or no, or no Brendan, and know that we know about 323 and are maybe inclined to email us questions about it. It is better if you email questions to form 323 at fcc.gov instead of to us directly. A bunch of us are monitoring that email box. That allows us to, to, to monitor what kind of questions we're getting, what's been answered. Um, it's just a lot easier on our end if uh, questions come through that email box rather to uh, us directly. So 
that way. And you're also also likely to get a, a quicker response that way. So that so that uh, if one of us happens to be out of the office or or uh, away from our desk at the time, uh, you you Im improve your chances of uh, of reaching us uh, in a in a uh, in a, a timely manner if uh, if you're sending it to using the FCC form three two three email address for us. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. As Jake says, this will be uh, this will be housed on the the website there, along with all of our other uh, resources. Um, and uh, I think also for those of you who are here in DC, that uh, that a couple of us will be um, uh, doing a a brown bag lunch with the uh, the the Federal Communications Bar Association here later in the month, where I'm sure we'll be answering uh, uh, some additional questions and and fielding questions and and uh, issues from filers along the way. So we're in the 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 beginning of the window now, and and I, I hope people will will go in early and start to prepare, but certainly reach out if they have any issues along the way, and we're here to help. So please uh, please feel free to to contact us as Jake suggests. So my thanks to uh, to Bill and Jake and the whole team behind us here to stream this live today. We appreciate uh, everybody joining us here and uh, and hope you all have a nice day.